I'm going to wait uh, about 30, 45 seconds or so to allow others to join. Uh, then we will proceed uh, with introductions. So we'll just wait for a, for a little bit. Oh, why don't we get going? I see people are still coming in. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Edward Cunningham. I'm director of the Ash Center China programs here at Harvard Kennedy School. And I'd like to start with a few announcements uh, on the Ash Center's behalf. We would like to acknowledge first the land on which Harvard sits as the traditional territory of the Massachusetts people and a place which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange among nations. We'd like to thank and acknowledge our co-sponsors, of course, for today's talk, the Davis Center for Russian and Eurasian Studies, Harvard Kennedy School's China Society, Fairbanks Center for Chinese Studies, and the Lakshmi Mittal and Family South Asia Institute at Harvard. Today's event, in terms of rules, is being recorded. Um, the video will be made publicly available on the Ash Center YouTube channel. You are welcome, of course, as always, to submit questions anytime and that I will then uh, read throughout the duration of the event. Please send them via the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen instead of the chat. So Q&A is the way to do that. And so now, most importantly, and I get the most pleasure, of course, uh, introducing our uh, featured author for today and good friend of mine who is joining us for today's book talk. Rosalind Xue is an associate professor of political science at Temple University and co-director of, of the Certificate in Political Economy, a program at the College of Liberal Arts. She's also a faculty affiliate of the Global Studies uh, and Asian Studies program at Temple. I think undoubtedly her most important time was the year we spent together as Fulbrights in China during our doctoral days that we both fondly remember. Professor Xue's research uh, focuses on comparative political economy, something that is near and dear uh, to my heart. Her book, which we're discussing today, is titled Micro Institutional Foundations of Capitalism, Sectoral Pathways to Globalization in China, India, and Russia. The book investigates the mediating role of market governance in the relationship between global economic integration and development outcomes across different sectors in these three countries. And lastly, what I personally love about her work to date, not just this book, is that she truly understands and privileges the role of sectors of their political and strategic value, as well as their economic makeup in her analysis of policy. I think my experience at least is few do that well, and I find it a crucial point to understand political economy across nations. That book uh, will be coming out in late May, uh, early June. So I will now hand the floor to Rosalind, who will present key arguments from her book, uh, we will reserve the last 15 to 20 minutes as usual for Q&A and audience questions. So please, again, do submit those at any time via the Q&A button. So now over to you, Rosalind. And thanks again for doing this with us. Thank you so much, Professor Cunningham, um, for the introductions. And indeed, my most memorable time in, you know, throughout all my field work um, was that year we spent together in Beijing. And um, at, you know, as Professor Cunningham mentioned, um, you know, it was such a memorable time. I remember walking across Beijing together, actually, um, several times, if I remember correctly. So yeah, thank you so much. And I also want to kind of, I want to give a shout out to um, Professor Sachs, Tony Sachs for um, giving me this opportunity to present um, findings of this new book, um, Micro-Institutional Foundations of Capitalism, Sectoral Pathways to Globalization in China, India, and Russia um, here at the Kennedy School. This is actually my first time um, sharing my research at the Kennedy School. 
Um, but at Harvard, I've been here twice um, for kind of early findings of my first book, China's Regulatory State, A New Strategy for Globalization. I presented actually um, at the Harvard Business School um, a, a few years ago. And then also the early findings, just some ideas of um, this book I presented um, at um, in the um, at the invitation of Wang Yuhua at the government department. So shout out to um, to Rao Abdullah at the business school and Wang Yuhua um, for for having me earlier. And so it is my um, distinct pleasure to present my book. Um, I am going to share screen and share a PowerPoint presentation if I can. Um, if I could have participant screen sharing, that would be great. Um, Let's see, I think it's disabled right now. Um, I will, oh, I think I'm a co-host now and I could do this, awesome. Um, so here it is. So um, I just wanna uh, uh, share my, my, my book's cover here. Um, this is actually, as Professor Cunningham I've mentioned, I, um, you know, the work is on looking at the political, the politics and the economics of sectors. And so, you know, I wasn't able to fit all countries and all the sectors covered in the book um, for the book cover. But here I have um, the power loom process, power loom production process in Gujarat, India, um, on the cover of the book. And as I um, share the book's findings, the, um, it, the power looms of India will, will come into the fore. Um, I, so, you know, to begin, I want to um, share a little bit kind of the motivation behind the book. Um, everyone assumes that there's a model to explain transition economies in the context of global economic integration. As we know, this has um, been termed as characterized as complex interdependence. And all countries are have been doing so, and particularly in the post-Cold War context, and you know, at the height of neoliberalism. And the countries under study, China, India, and Russia are, are no exceptions in this global economic integration. Um, and the assumption also though, is that the um, globalization trajectories are at the national level. They are linear and unitary. Um, and increasingly we have um, studies that have looked at subnational trajectories and particularly for large developing countries of comparable size, you know, of the, the ones under focus um, in this book, you know, they are large, complex, and um, so subnational trajectories have been um, a main focus. Well, in this study, what I do is I, you know, build on my previous book on China and I explore the analytical utility of taking the study cross regionally to compare these large developing countries and then to the industry and also the subsector. And by doing so, I'm able to uncover a new model of globalization, a new model of globalization in this age of economic um, integration, in this age of globalization of complex interdependence. These countries are of comparable size. They are similar timing in the most recent age of globalization. The book traces historically, actually from sectoral origins, um, as well as the last several decades. But in, they have similar timing. And by, by the similar timing, I'm referring to the 1990s and beyond and beyond. So we have the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991. We have Big Bang liberalization in India. And then also Deng Xiaoping's Southern Tour in 92 um, and beyond after um, Tiananmen, Tiananmen Square incident. And so, um, you know, similar timing, I'm able to control for that. And also what I um, control for is, um, it's, are the existing industrial bases. And um, these existing industrial bases, I show through tr process tracing um, from sectoral origins. And I'll come back to that when I talk about the research design and also when I um, share um, substantive findings from the book. I examine labor intensive um, industries and then also capital intensive industries and subsectors within them. Um, some academic motivations, um, you know, often people study China and, um, you know, and China is really already quite large. There's a lot to study in the politics and economics of China. Um, and, um, but, but what I do in this book is I, you know, very boldly make the claim that, that um, theoretical work 
that looks and examines China could also then be um, built upon and refined to understand other models of globalization. And um, there have been existing scholars that have made this, these claims that actually, in fact, scholarship on China could contribute to building um, theory and comparative politics. Scholarship on India contrib can contribute to building um, theory on um, in comparative politics. And so much of my work is also at the intersection of comparative politics and international relations. The strategic value framework, which I will introduce in um, the presentation, really is at that intersection. And a lot of work um, at, you know, in IR and at that intersection emphasize ideas, norms, and identity. And so I find inspiration um, in, in those works as well. So I, you know, I've mentioned already, these countries have liberalized and they've done so by joining the World Trade Organization um, as regional members of the World Trade Organization, but they've done so by departing from the East Asian developmental state model. And, you know, famously the state-led development model um, of the East Asian tigers, they um, restricted foreign direct investment to promote the domestic sector and famously the autonomous bureaucracy. Right. And so what I um, show and what I argue is that, you know, these countries have departed from this model in this age of neoliberalism in that they've actually been quite open on the macro level to foreign direct investment. At the same time, in their openness, they differed from the historical Latin American experience of, you know, open economy and then being susceptible to exploitation of coalitions of foreign direct investment, local interests, and sometimes even um, with the role of the state. Um, these countries have liberalized, but we haven't seen that same historical um, Latin American um, experience. And so, it, you know, so just kind of to show you some data of the openness of these three countries, we have in 1980, before even the collapse of the Soviet Union, these countries are quite closed economies, right? They were um, socialist transitioning, quite closed economies. Fast forward 15 years later, we now FDI as a percentage of GDP. Um, we're beginning to see that actually they're, you know, they're um, exceeding the United States and of course the East Asian tigers, South Korea, Taiwan, and Japan. And, um, in its openness um, on this measure of globalization. Um, and then in, by 2015, we see that, you know, they continue to be, you know, in terms of FDI as a percentage of GDP, still quite open to the global economy. Um, here's a cross time perspective um, for the three countries and seeing that, you know, there's been ebbs and flows, including during, of course, the East Asian financial crisis and the global financial crisis, ebbs and flows in terms of openness on this measure, but you know, consequently have really also you know converged in terms of its um, openness, making these three countries um, quite ripe for co comparison and looking at how they have treated um, globalization um, across sectors. Another measure of openness is exports of goods and services as percentage of GDP. And again, we see a convergence for these three countries. Um, so they differ from the East Asian developmental state model. They differ from kind of a more open Latin America historical model. Yet these three countries have in fact also re-regulated and they have re-regulated, you know, during, you know, the East Asian financial crisis, the global um, 2008 global financial crisis, um, but they've done so in quite distinct ways. And they've done so um, as they vary across industrial sectors within country, leading to distinct development outcomes. Um, and um, here I, you know, just kind of to show you one measure of development outcomes in science and technology patents, you know, the conventional wisdom is that China outshines everyone. And here, you know, s and model, you know, patents at the macro level, certainly that appears to, um, to, to, to ring true to the conventional wisdom. But then once we disaggregate to the industry and then also to the subsector, we see quite a different picture. And this is where it is quite important to open the macro economy and examine at the micro industry level. Here we um, see that, you know, that, that kind of conventional wisdom of China outperforming everyone. We see that there's some variation on this measure of development outcomes. Um, in Russia, um, ICT and in India, ICT, we see actually um, 
you know, China, excuse me, these countries outperforming China in the subsectors of telecoms. So what is the relationship between internal development and integration into the global economy? How do state market relations differ? Um, and surprisingly, I'm gonna make that argument now um, that you know, state market relations matter and they're gonna matter at the micro industry level. And importantly, these differences will have um, implications for development outcomes. And also it will matter for post Cold War era of global conflict and cooperation. And so during the q and um, I'm very happy to answer questions about impacts um, for even the most recent um, geopolitics that we are seeing um, um, today. So I'm gonna front load some of the arguments. This is what I argue, I argue a new theory of globalization pathways. I argue that market governance structures mediate this relationship between um, globalization and development. The strategic value framework, which um, theorizes that perceived strategic value of sector as state elites respond to internal and external pressures, interacting with sectoral structures and organization of institutions will shape that national and within country sectoral patterns of market governance. And that together, these national configurations of sectoral models, that's why I'm calling these uh, globalization pathways, are the micro institutional foundations of capitalism. They are important for how you know, uh, businesses operate, for the behaviors of businesses, for the behavior of industry. These are institutional foundations for um, capitalistic behaviors and um, practices. And this new model of globalization pathways will have implication for global politics and economics. Um, at the kind of the, the national sectoral level, these national configurations um, I am gonna show um, and talk about um, is that techno security developmentalism will shape bifurcated capitalism in China, where we see centralization of governance of high tech dual use sectors and the decentralization of labor intensive labor value added sectors. These are large economies with um, you know, integration into the global economy. There's only so much state capacity to go around. And so how will the state mobilize state capacity? How will the state interact with business and industry? There is this, this interacting strategic value and sectoral logic. We see that in the neoliberal self-reliance, shaping bifurcated liberalism um, in, in India, which centralizes governance of small-scale rural sectors. India today is probably one of the only countries that has a ministry of textiles. Um, and uh, so the importance of small-scale rural sector to the strategic value orientation of the government um, will shape that bifurcated liberalism. But at the same time, India is very integrated in the globally highly technologically advanced um, sectors. And so there will be decentralization and uh, more competition in those sectors. In Russia, we see security resource nationalism, which shapes what I argue a bifurcated oligarchy, which centralizes the governance of infrastructure and resource sectors and decentralizes labor intensive labor uh, less value added sectors. And this is true despite the conventional wisdom of the collapse of the Soviet Union, massive privatization and liberalization. And I show that in my um, uh, multi-level case studies. And so what I'm gonna do next is I'm gonna um, discuss the research design and methods. I'm gonna quickly introduce to you my um, conceptualization of market governance so that I could systematically um, trace across industries and sectors and also then the strategic value framework. Um, and um, I will show some evidence from countries and sectors. Obviously, I'm not gonna be able to introduce all of the evidence in this talk. And so during q and I'm um, very happy to um, discuss the details. And so the research design um, and methods for this study is that it's a comparative case research design at different levels of analysis. We have country, industry, subsector, and company, allowing me then to substantiate my arguments about these national configurations of sectoral models. I process trace from sectoral origins. So then I'm able to trace from the very beginning of mechanized textiles in China, 
India and Russia. From the very beginning of investments in telecommunications infrastructure, um, how state elites have responded to internal and external pressures with the strategic value orientation that I've identified. Um, and then importantly, I then systematically examined textiles and telecoms in all three countries starting from um, 1980s and beyond. I look, um, the reason I started 1980s is because um, I looked at before the big bang globalization in these three countries, and then also after to substantiate the argument about the interacting strategic value and sectoral logics. I do a lot of field work. Um, the work is substantiated by semi-structured in-depth interviews and on-site visits to the three countries, to you know, New York, Silicon Valley, Washington, DC. I talk to key government, industry, company, and civil society stakeholders. Um, and I also examine published and unpublished documentary evidence descriptive statistics that I gather from national governments, business and industry associations, foreign delegations, and international organizations. Here I have a, just a, a really quick snapshot of um, photos from the field. Um, I have um, a bookshop right outside of the Red Square in Moscow that I took. You know, these countries are interested in each other. Um, the, an image um, here on the bottom right of, um, of a bookshop um, in, in Wangfujing, actually, in Beijing, and a photo of, um, of an exhibit, actually, on Brazil state making um, that I took very recently on my most recent trip to India a couple weeks ago um, in central Delhi. And so these countries are interested in understanding each other, what motivates um, state elites, what motivates and drives behaviors of business and industry. And I also then make the claim that this strategic value framework can also understand other models of globalization trajectories. So whether it's other countries in the BRICS um, or um, other developing countries. So in terms of my conceptualization of market governance, the dependent variable of the study, I um, look at two dimensions. These are socialist transitioning countries. So it's really important to look at not just the property rights arrangements, but also level and scope of state and market coordination. So what I mean by this is that just because we have an industry that is dominated by state-owned enterprises, it doesn't mean that the state is actually in fact um, uh, play a very big role in market coordination. Um, on the flip side, just because we have an industry or subsector that's dominated by private um, property rights arrangements, it doesn't mean that the state no longer is um, interested in um, market coordination. So that's why it's very important to see how these two dimensions interact. And by doing so, I'm able to come up with a conceptual map and taxonomy of market governance. Then I could then um, map how the strategic value framework and the strategic value orientation for these three countries explain these dominant patterns of national configurations of sectoral models. Um, market coordination is important because I can identify central level and um, decentralized level or even mixed government authorities um, in industries, bureaucracy, regulator, or government sponsored or non-government um, bodies. Uh, the distribution of property rights arrangements are important because then I can identify the controlling interests, whether it's government or private stakeholders or mixed ownership in any given sector, subsector, and market governance, I mean, excuse me, market segment. And then together, I have this typology of market governance that allow us to then um, score the different industries and subsectors that I study and you know, presumably be able to apply the strategic value framework to understand other countries and other sectors. I um, want to uh, give a nod to, the, to, to, to you know, the dominant perspectives that are um, out there to understand globalization trajectories. What I do um, in the book is that I call these dominant perspectives the common forces of change. While my model, strategic value framework model, challenges conventional wisdom about national models, about subnational uh, uh, characteristics, um, and um, challenges conventional wisdom about the, you know, the, the dominance of regime type to explain these variations, 
It is also important to recognize that these are common forces of change that um, all industries in these countries grapple with. So open economy politics, of course, sectoral interests matter. Of course, subnational characteristics matter. And by tracing across time from sectoral origins, I understand that historical legacies will play an important role. Um, and regime type certainly reinforces um, the dominant sectoral patterns of market governance that I identify. But what I make the claim is that these are um, uh, factors that shape all industries within these nations, and yet we see variation. We see that centralization of governance in certain sectors and the decentralization of governance in other sectors. And um, in the detailed case studies, the multi-level case studies, I show um, how and when and the complexity of these common forces of change um, within these dominant patterns of um, governance identified by the strategic value framework. And so here then I will talk about the strategic value framework. Um, what it does is it bridges materialist arguments, constructivism and historical institutionalism. I'm able to show how objective um, factors matter, uh, objective factors about how state elites examine and, um, and, and, and think about the, um, the strategic value of sectors. At the same time, their intersubjectivity will play an important role. And that I'm able to show and trace across time on how the path dependence of certain ideas and values and identities um, help to sh shape and, um, how state at least think about objective values of, um, of the importance of sectors. And I do so um, by process tracing historically. It's this strategic value orientation that shows the dominant patterns of market governance across countries and sectors. And so, um, well, you may ask, what, um, how do we measure and think about strategic value? So I identify political and economic dimensions um, on the objective, um, uh, you know, uh, in terms of objective measures, the importance of sectors for social and political stability and regime legitimacy play an important role. Um, their application for national security, internal security, that's important. Um, those are, you know, certainly important objective measures of strategic value to um, state elites. On the economic dimension, you know, how do sectors, you know, contribute to the national technology base? How do they contribute to the economic growth and global competitiveness of industry? All countries and all, you know, uh, you know, state elites care about you know, the importance of national security. They care about the importance of economic development. But what, how do these values on the objective level um, uh, matter to state elites as they respond to internal and external pressures across time will um, uh, be hinged on also the intersubjectivity of how state elites define, make claims upon and contest political and economic pressures. And I'm able to show that across time on how, for example, in the beginnings of mechanized textiles in China, you know, uh, you know, during the, 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 the post opium war, um, you know, era where, you know, British and Japanese um, investment, you know, invested in mechanized textiles and how across regimes, whether it's you know, the, the, the Qing dynasty, the Republican Chinese and the Mao era and beyond during the reform era, we see the importance of, um, you know, uh, of, of kind of the, the, the nationalism and uh, the, the, the insecurity of the lack of economic development, the lack of economic development in response to um, um, foreign interventions and how that nationalist insecurity have over time um, uh, created a strategic value orientation where whereas leaders across different political regimes have brought to bear that strategic value orientation of the importance of you know, economic development, the importance of contribution and application for national security to apply to how they think about um, industries and subsectors across time. And, um, and so by tracing across time, I'm able to see that, um, show you that strategic value orientation for all three countries. Importantly, it's also important to look at sectoral organization of, um, of institutions, to look at sectoral structures, because the reality is telecommunications will be telecommunications, whether we are in Russia, um, India, or China. 
right? They will have infrastructure, um, uh, the importance of the communications infrastructure. Value added services will be operating on top of um, the, the, uh, the, um, the infrastructure. And so for the authoritarian regime of China, for example, um, for the government to own um, and have control of market entry for the infrastructure in China telecoms, in China mobile, then the government could be more open to the value added services um, that operate on top of um, the telecommunications infrastructure. That's why we then see, you know, the Tencents, the Alibabas and um, the Ent groups that operate on top of the infrastructure. But then when internal and external pressures um, become important, then that strategic value orientation of application for national security and the national technology base will then, um, you know, shape how the state elites will intervene in those sectors. And so most recently, two years ago, very famously, and um, to the concern of lots of foreign direct investment, the Chinese government actually intervened in um, the market governance and even um, in the property rights arrangements of value added services on top of telecoms, right, of um, Alibaba and the Ent Group. And so that strategic value orientation will respond to internal and external pressures that um, will come to the fore across time. But at the same time, it's important to recognize that sectoral structures and existing organization of institutions will have impact. So it's this interacting logic of strategic value and sectoral attributes that will explain the techno security developmentalism in China, the neoliberal self-reliance in India, and security resource nationalism in Russia. So I've talked a little bit about China. Um, you know, I'll explain a little bit about India. You know, strategic are what I've identified rural small-scale industries and sectors, important for employment, right, an objective measure, um, and sensitive for sectarian conflict because they employ a lot of people, a lot of um, uh, populations that are very diverse in India. Um, and these are also important sectors um, uh, and, and also important our infrastructural sectors for collective gain. But they are sectors associated with post-independence nationalist imagination, a function of Gandhi and Swadeshianism of self-reliance, which have influenced also Nehruvian socialism um, on the one hand. But on the other hand, we have high-tech globalized sectors that were most affected by that big bang liberalization that we saw beginning in the 1980s, but really, um, really very much into the 1990s and beyond. Um, and then so, and then for the Russia case, we see that strategic are sectors with defense orientation. Um, and so as we apply that defense orientation, which is really a function of the military industrial complex of the Soviet Union, what we see is that in telecommunications infrastructure, which um, have military and civilian um, functions, even while the Russian Federation massively introduced privatization, massively introduced competition, what is little, very little known is that in fact, the Russian Federation never actually um, privatized telecommunications infrastructure. What the Russian government did um, was decentralized infrastructure to the regional governors. But when Putin came into power in 1998 financial crisis and beyond, um, what Putin did was to centralize the um, property rights arrangements and market governance um, coordination of the infrastructural sectors of telecommunications network. Um, and to the point that today, Russell Telecoms own the telecommunications backbone infrastructure that then could control what operates on top of the infrastructure for information, control of information dissemination. And um, so despite that really, really competitive um, markets for value added services since the collapse of the Soviet Union, the state um, over time of centralization of governance because of strategic value orientation um, and the importance of those sectors for national security and political um, regime consolidation now um, can control information dissemination for um, you know, uh, state elite purposes. And so um, what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna show you um, some evidence from, um, from, from the, the, the three national case studies in the sectors. So techno security developmentalism, what we see is the centralized governance of the more um, 
of, of sectors that have national security applications in the decentralization of labor intensive. Indian, I mean, excuse me, Chinese textiles is one of China's most marketized, marketized um, industries dominated by private industry. And we're not going to see centralization, um, even um, with the advent of Xi Jinping centralization in um, 2013 and beyond. In um, that the high tech sectors, even though there have been a lot of foreign direct investment um, uh, in these sectors, the government um, con continues to regulate um, industry and business um, developments. SMIC is a really interesting case that I'd like to point out. It actually began as foreign direct investment in 2000. But today, most people know SMIC as China's state-owned, you know, premier indigenous semiconductor um, manufacturer. But in fact, it was FDI. But developments across the last two decades prior to Xi Jinping coming into power in 2013, we've seen corporate governance reorganization. We've seen the dilution, like diluting of foreign direct investment to a point where SMIC kind of, you know, the important input into many infrastructural sectors now being a state-owned enterprise, um, and you know, representative of the the the, the market liberalization and re-regulation um, in the centralization of market gov governance in the strategic sectors. And so here, I you know, I show you um, state-owned infrastructure, private um, stakeholders um, in the centralized strategic sectors. We have textiles being very much decentralized. Now it varies by subsector, right? So the more technical sectors, we will have more centralized, uh, it, um, you know, oversight. We're going to see Ministry of Science and Technology, even though there's no longer a Ministry of Textiles. But the SNT bureaucracies will be more interested and will provide subsidies for these um, uh, more uh, strategic subsectors of non-strategic sectors. We hear just some data to show you how textiles is one of the most privatized sectors in, in China today. Um, now I'm going to move on to looking at India, neoliberal self-reliance and a bifurcated liberalism. We have, you know, this, the importance of small scale industry, the importance of these rural sectors, you know, in the nationalist imagination, you know, Gandhi uh, mobilized independence um, through uh, advocating for the importance of small scale industry. And Gandhi famously did that with, um, with you know, in, uh, uh, private entrepreneurs, national private entrepreneurs uh, with national industry. And so to this day, um, political elites in India's democracy, including Modi, have to evoke and continues to evoke the importance of that idea of self-reliance. At the same time, we have sectors um, that are globally connected, that are quite decentralized and deregulated. And where this is where we see the importance of neoliberal ideas. We um, you know, saw in the 1980s and beyond, um, India sending bureaucrats from the national, from the Indian um, Service Administration to um to 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 you know to Thatcher's England to get um to, to get trained in neoliberal policies. And so we see this very bifurcated picture where the big bang liberalization is applied very differently across industries in India's large and complex economy. And so lots of competitive market players and even a telecoms regulator. Now, of course, you know, oftentimes um, claims of being captured by political parties in India's vibrant democracy. At the same time, it's a, it's an independent regulator um, regulating a very competitive um, marketplace. The Ministry of Textiles, I've mentioned, you know, the central ministry, one of the only central ministries of textiles in the world today, still protects through, you know, uh, through uh, subsidies, through exemptions for taxation and so forth, small scale producers. Um, important for objective measures of, you know, employment, of ensuring um, stability in sectoral, sectarian conflict, but also important for the nationalist imagination of um, nationalism of, of um, what actually is important to the Indian um, nationalist independence um, in the last several decades. And here's just some data to show you subsector breakdown of where handlooms and 
um, power looms, these small scale sectors, uh, some of which are actually quite environmentally high polluting, um, continue to dominate Indian textiles. The mill sector, you know, the more industrialized, mechanized, um, advanced sectors are, is a very small part of the textiles industry. And these subsidies and exemptions to an extent that even, um, you know, business groups and private entrepreneurs take advantage of um, these exemptions and subsidies by investing in hand looms and power looms. So it provides that path, you know, the path dependency effects that's much more intersubjective that may not necessarily be objectively, you know, um, uh, uh, contributing to, for example, India's technological development. And so here are just some pictures from the field of the more labor intensive, highly polluting power looms and hand looms. Um, finally, quickly, um, I know in the last few minutes, I will talk about um, Russia and resource security nationalism. I mentioned that Russell Telecoms was never privatized um, and that any decentralization began to be centralized um, um, in terms of into one um, national telecommunications um, infrastructural um, property rights owner. And so to an extent that you know, the Russian government have control of the infrastructure that this big map that I see, I show you. Textiles, on the other hand, um, actually was seen, you know, as unimportant to an extent that it became decentralized and deregulated as early as um, uh, during the times of Gorbachev, during Perestroika and Glasnost. And so Indian text, excuse me, Russian textiles to some extent was left to languish for decades using very, you know, integrated equipment. Um, and um, really any of the state intervention that we see today came after 2014, where techni when technical textiles, you know, with inputs um, that actually utilizes Russia's um, petrochemical and oil resources um, became important. And that's where then Putin and state elites responding to um, internal and external pressures began to um, implement import substitution industrialization in the technical sectors of textiles, which for decades were left to languish. So, you know, um, telecoms, fixed line ownership, but um, a very much um, open competitive playing field for value added services for decades until very recently. Um, this is true for IT software as well, until very recently rules on data storage and dissemination um, in, um, in the last decade or so. And so here's just a picture of, you know, old equipment until Putin suddenly, you know, in the post Crimea period era, you know, uh, in response to actually even um, local oligarchies and regional oligarchs that um, started pushing import substitution policies, some of which um, uh, are um, are objective, but some of which are less than objective. You know, you know, it, technical textiles has been an industry that was dominated by FDI, and so some of the new investments may or may not make sense um, for um, te technical textiles in Russia, and yet in response to internal and external pressures, that strategic value orientation began to um, implement import substitution policies. So I just, um, and here just in a, uh, some data on, on looking at um, technical textiles in, in Russia. So I just wanna end uh, with some thoughts about development outcomes. That these value, strategic value orientations um, may or may not be actually good for development outcomes, but in fact, the dominant patterns of market governance is what has risen to the fore um, based on that interacting strategic value and sectoral logics. And they have um, implications for global conflict and cooperation, whether it's a trade war, tech war, initial COVID response, or um, uh, Russia's um, you know, intervention and then invasion in the Ukraine. Uh, globalization pathways vary by country and sector within country. And they, these dominant patterns of market governance have um, shaped value-bounded rationality, um, are, are shaped by, by value-bounded rationality in institutions and um, have effects for development outcomes, um, uh, patterns of um, global capitalism and um, geopolitics today. And so I will end my presentation today and thank you very much um, for uh, listening to me today. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Rosalind. So we have 
a whole bunch of different questions, some that came in earlier and then some that came in as you were speaking. What I'll do is uh, also, and there's a lot of patterns here, so I'll combine a couple. Um, I was interested in what, in terms of implications, pick up on that last piece, um, what your thoughts are around, it's clear the implications on, on sort of political economy writ large and also uh, those topics you just mentioned. When it comes to growth, jobs, sort of innovation, what do you think the implications are of, of these different aspects of constraining the private sector? So relatedly, Adam Greco asked, are, are China's present policies, for example, around uh, uh, protecting social media, right? So socially disconnecting um, citizens from the rest of the world through that, through constraining social media and, and news sources, is that really sustainable considering policies to support globalization and the role of the private sector? So that's a similar. Um, and uh, relatedly, do you also, the third one um, in this group, do you think that when you look at seemingly liberal, liberal policies uh, in strategic industries, so allowing American Express to clear transactions in RMB or Tesla to own 100% of Tesla China, do you read those moves more as, as sort of confidence in the domestic players that can now compete successfully in the strategic uh, areas or just that um, something more? Uh, how do you how do you think through the, those types of um, policies that we also see in highly strategic sectors? Great, yeah, thank you so much um, for those questions. Um, yeah, I will. You know, I will take the kind of them backwards. So I'll start with the uh, the last questions about. Um, uh, some of the moves to being more open to FDI, right? Um, you know, China's model, um, famously, and as I've identified in, in my first book as well, is that it's it's both about being open, but then, you know, then re-regulating, right, as a second step. So um, this liberalization two-step. So what are, you know, what are the motivations for that liberalization two-step? Is it about, um, uh, you know, controlling information dissemination? Is it about, you know, as you mentioned, like the confidence of, um, of, 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 of the domestic sector and its growth. Mm -hmm. um, I think quite informative would be the, um, it would be the industrial trajectory of, um, of e-payment. And, um, and, and I mentioned e-payment with, you know, Alibaba and then the Ant Group is because mm -hmm. in the beginning, in the, you know, 2010s, especially for those of you who have been following um, this sector, China was very open to um, foreign direct investment. And in fact, um, famously um, then divested that foreign direct investment um, in, you know, whether it was um, Yahoo and SoftBank's um, investment, or even in the early, earlier era in um, some of the um, foreign equity investment in um, even the, um, the infrastructural sectors. And so they, um, you know, utilized FDI to achieve um, national development goals and um, to develop the private sector, right? Um, and um, then forced divestment of that FDI or began to really carefully calibrate what the business scope of that FDI would look like. And so by just looking at those kind of patterns over time, I would, I would venture to guess that some of what is happening today is one kind of a signal to the international economy that we're not entirely closed, right? We're still open. So there's that important um, international signal to the global economy. But then also importantly, in terms of motivations, it is, it is to show that, hey, you know, we have um, the, the private sector that is now more developed. Um, all the same, though, as some of the state interventions that we've seen in Alibaba and the reorganization of the end group shows is that the government, the Chinese government um, with its strategic value orientation will not shy away from state intervention if in response to internal pressures um, of, you know, of needing to politically consolidate you know, industry, the government will do so. So, um, so I think it's um, that that dance will not um, will not um, end. And in terms of um, social policy regulations, I think really important. You know, if we're going to look at the hierarchy of goals, right? If we're going to look at the hierarchy of strategic value orientations. I think the political dimension is very important. And so I think that the of uh, the importance of controlling information dissemination, of controlling um, you know actions on the social level, that's still going to be very important. Um, and um, and so that that recalibration of you know foreign direct investment, but also private 
um, uh, actions of um, private industry. That recalibration will continue to, to be there in, um, with this strategic value orientation. Um, and in terms of impact, um, you know, really not just for China, but for all countries um, and, you know, under consideration for labor and for um, national development and so forth, I think the Indian case is really important because, you know, it is true that the textiles industry employ a lot of people. They employ a, um, the industry across subsectors, employ a lot of people in terms of small scale industry, but also even the larger and more advanced textile mills. And that objective measure of um, strategic value is, is very important. And um, even as they interact on, you know, on the intersubjective level. And so we're gonna see in India's democracy in terms of electoral politics, both at the national level parties, but also regional level and ethnic religious parties that will continue to appeal on those, um, on the national constituents, um, you know, our, 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 our workers are, are, you know, they're employed by these small scale and uh, industries and, and, and so forth. So indeed, there are going to be these path dependent and um, effects on, um, on development outcomes across a, multi, a, multi, a multi-dimensional outcomes. Thank you very right. much. Thanks, Rosalind. Um, we have we have more China questions uh, that that are interesting here. The Abdul Sufi uh, writes, "Thank you for your interesting talk. Could you please elaborate a bit on the concept of bifurcated capitalism? What does it really mean?" And um, he also argues, "You know, the rapid increase in the number of patents in China in the early two in the early two thousands is due uh, largely to the adoption of industrial policy. What role do you believe industrial policy plays in the development of technology in China?" Uh, and then finally, are you related to Xue Muqiao, the uh, the author? <laughs> I am not related, so I'll answer that question first. No. Um, and um, in terms of so bifurcated capitalism, um, and by by, by by my my conceptualization of bifurcated capitalism essentially reflects that. Um, those, you know, the patterns of um, the strategic value orientation of, um, you know, kind of more centralized governance and decentralized governance. And it's bifurcated capitalism because, you know, sector, for example, you know, I'll give you the example of sector associations. They are not made equal in this bifurcated capitalism um, uh, 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 image of uh, characterization, meaning that, you know, telecommunications sector associations are going to work very closely and, in fact, are going to be controlled by you know, uh, uh, MIIT. They're gonna be controlled by different ministries, by, you know, the, uh, the different um, uh, working groups of the state council. At the same time, um, state and sector associations were um, basically deregulated and um, decentralized uh, former ministries at in the other industries that are not considered strategic to the Chinese government. And so what we see is this very bifurcated picture where then companies, businesses, you know, civil society that operate within these, you know, within these varying dominant patterns are going to have um, a very different um, um, uh, uh, behaviors and are going to have very different experiences, which is why even as, you know, China restricts and recalibrates foreign direct investment and private investment in certain industries, we still have many companies and many industries really calculating and thinking about, you know, their future in China. They, you know, they continue to invest in China um, and they certainly would like to, and they are, you know, looking at a very different image. And in fact, that's what drove me to study China in the first place is because I began to see after WTO accession that, you know, we're seeing very different types of capitalisms within, um, within China's state capitalism. And in terms of industrial policy, um, this industrial policy is a combination or um, it's a strategic use of private investment and foreign direct investment. And um, we, have, um, we have private entrepreneurs taking advantage of um, the industrial policy, taking advantage of the subsidies, working with, you know, um, you know, state bureaucracies, um, you know, famously Jack Ma, right, of um, Alibaba did so. Right in twenty in twenty ten when Yahoo and Software were forced to divest, um, you know, or at least there were policies that would force that sort of divestment. You know, Jack Ma responded to it and said, "Hey, e payment is only for private industry now, and so therefore we don't need our foreign direct investors anymore, and um, therefore um, you know we're going to dilute the investment of um, of foreign investors." And so 
the it's you know that industrial policy will affect how you know um, capitalists and how businesses and sectors um, operate, um, and and that's why um, I call this the institutional foundations of capitalism. Right, and then and then on that point, in fact, there's a question that that was sent to us much earlier uh, yesterday before this talk around really in the end how do you this 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 reaches across the different countries so it's not country specific um how do you think about the persistence how how persistent are micro institutions in the face of large or macro events and and how does that affect their ultimate contribution to change so so it's that that tension between sort of micro institutions and then major restructuring events that are either political or economic Oh, uh, you're 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 muted. Thank you very much for that question. And, yeah. and I, I think it, it, you know, large events, you know, these kind of internal and external pressures could have big bang effects, right? And I think um, a very good representative example of that would be um, technical textiles in Russia. Right and and also industries with important re import you know uh, import with important imports and also effects for um, Russia's um, uh, resource sectors of um, you know importance of resource and infrastructural sectors for 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 Russia and so um, th that would be a good example where um, where these kind of events will come about and sectors like textiles, you know, long deregulated and decentralized to a point where the government doesn't care. And in fact, um, you know, in, um, in, in the post-Soviet collapse era, ne neither did foreign direct investment. It was, a, you know, it, it, even though Russia today is the largest fashion apparel market in the world, but that market is very much dominated by foreign capital, by black and gray markets, in fact, um, from other parts of the world. Um, there were white, there was not, there was no productive capacity in um, apparel and textiles and clothing um, and technical textiles. But imperatives um, that come to the fore as state elites to respond to internal and external pressures, you know, in the post Crimea era, in the post Georgian war period, you know, now in the Ukraine invasion, we're going to see that there's going to be big banging effects. Um, COVID, you know, obviously played an important role too. I, though, um, argue that um, some, the strategic value orientation may um, and have and will continue to affect how countries respond to COVID. And so for one example of that is that, you know, famously China shut down, right? Shut down um, the entire, uh, uh, you know, industries, um, at, right? As they responded to COVID in February, 2020. But in fact, in the most strategic sectors, you know, in semiconductors, in, you know, telecoms equipment and, and so forth, you know, we had, you know, we saw factories continue to churn in Wuhan, even as Wuhan was shut down, even as, you know, there were all these kind of debates on whether COVID, coronavirus came out of Wuhan. And so um, that strategic value orientation continued to um, shape how market governance was structured, even in the face of certain, you know, what, are considered extraordinary um, developments in the world. So, um, and so certainly these developments are important, but the strategic value orientation will play a role um, in shape, um, in, in, in state elites and, and business responses. Thank you. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. So we're, we're uh, right on time, we're about uh, 1 p.m. So I just wanna thank everyone for uh, sending in their questions, both before and during. Uh, thank Professor Shuya, obviously, for joining us, taking the time. Uh, we're really excited about the book coming out late May, early June. Um, and of course, uh, thanks for your contributions and, and good luck with your other talks. I know you're doing quite a bit of them, and we appreciate it being on your dance card. So have a great uh, day. Enjoy your sabbatical as well. And uh, thank you.